thanks everyone for taking time to join our session. So excuse me, my voice is a bit low. Um, my name is Sadiq. Uh, I'm working as a senior cloud success architect, uh, primarily concentrating on, on cloud and OpenStack. And this is my colleague Rahul, who is uh, a senior specialist solution architect concentrating on Red Hat storage. As you all know, OpenStack is an operating system for the cloud that requires storage. There are innumerable storage products and solutions available in the market. Choosing the right storage for your OpenStack cloud is of paramount importance than what you think. Throughout this session, we are going to help you to understand certain factors that need to be considered while architecting multiple storage backend for your OpenStack cloud to support various workloads while meeting the performance, scalability, and capacity requirements. So the goal of this session is to make you capable of choosing the right storage for your OpenStack cloud yourself. Let me and Rahul will help you to do that, to achieve that. So let me first explain how this presentation is organized. We will first uh, explore what are some of the basic characteristics of a cloud and, and a cloud storage. Then we will go through some of the general strategies that you need, you need to consider while uh, choosing the sto storage, for, while designing the storage for your workloads and for your, to achieve your business requirements. Then we will deep dive into certain factors that are specific to OpenStack that, that need to be considered while choosing the storage for it. Then we will conclude our session by giving you a brief overview of what is Red Hat self storage and how it is, it is going to be one of the right storage for OpenStack. So let's explore some of the basic characteristics of a cloud. So for an end user, a cloud is going to give an illusion of infinite cap resource capacity and on-demand scalability of those resources. So this means a cloud is massively scalable, and when it comes to on-demand scalability, it's very easy to expand and fully supports on-demand rapid provisioning to meet the speed and agility requirements for your business. So the notion of under-provisioning and over-provisioning is non-existent within the cloud as a result of the inherent elasticity feature within every cloud. Using cloud, you are no longer required to worry about future business growth, and you need, you need not foresee future resource requirements and over allocate, allocate them today to accommodate future expansion and, and, and growth of your business. So this is going to significantly help, help you to significantly reduce the capital expenditure for your business. So another important, uh, important characteristic of a cloud is it's going to allow you to follow or adopt a pay-as-you-go model. So that means you are going to provision the resources required for your business today, and you are going to pay for that. And if the demand for the resources is going to increase in the future, you are going to scale out, and if the demand is going to, to, to come down, then you are going to, to uh, scale down your infrastructure and resources. At any given point of time, you are going to pay for, what you, for your actual utilization. Self-service is another important characteristic of a cloud. And to achieve self-service, you need to have a robust user interface and a simplified API while fully supporting uh, isolation between multiple tenants. So why am I enumerating all these general characteristics of a cloud Well, I am expected to talk about storage? So let's come to the point. There are three primary resource types within every cloud that powers every cloud. One is uh, compute, and the one is storage and networking. So storage is one of them, and the storage that you are going to use within the cloud must meet all, must have all the characteristics, characteristics that I just explained, just like compute and network. So let's try to understand that means uh, storage should be massively scalable, and it should be very, very, very easy to expand and it should fully support on-demand rapid provisioning of uh, rapid provisioning. So let's try to understand that for compute resources, you normally use hypervisors powered by commodity hardwares, and if the increase for compute resources are going, if there is an increase for the compute resources, then uh, you, are, you can keep adding more nodes into the cluster to meet the increased requirements for, the, for, for your compute resources. But on the same OpenStack environment, suppose you are going to use a storage appliance which has a maximum capacity limit. 
And this, is, this means you will be able to grow your compute resources and network resources, but you are going to hit a big brick wall when it comes to scaling your storage. So because of this, it's, it's very, very important that you understand your workload, you understand your use cases, and you choose the right storage in the beginning itself. So uh, with all these points in mind, let's try to understand what are some of the general strategies that we need to consider while uh, architecting the storage to meet your business requirements and to meet your workload requirements. Thanks, Abhi. So story is all about workloads. It comes in all shapes and sizes, and none of the workloads are identical. So getting your storage right is essential for your cloud. Storage might be at the bottom of the stack, but it shouldn't be your last consideration. And with a whole lot of storage players, vendors, and storage technologies out there, we, we believe that this session will be able, able to help you to narrow down your search to few selected players which are right for your cloud strategy. So to get this right, we need to undergo six key design principles. The first factor, the first point, to qualify the need for scale-out storage. We need to understand whether our applications have been designed to work on scale-out storage. Does it understand a distributed storage? Is my application designed for a scale-up storage? That is a key consideration point. The second factor, designing for I.O. workload profiles. Our storage should be designed and architected to meet the requirements of our workload I.O. profiles. The third point, choosing right storage access methods. In an enterprise, you will be seeing different types of workloads, different types of applications. All these types of applications need different types of access mechanisms. It could be block, fiber channel, iSCSI, network attached storage. It could be object storage. The new type of applications needs object storage. So once you do the application profiling, once you understand the access mechanisms of your application, then you can decide which storage subsystem can provide all those different types of access protocols. The fourth point, identifying the capacity. We need to know what's the usable capacity we need to have. And without capacity, storage doesn't make sense. The fifth point, risk tolerance. It boils down to your SLA. How, many, how much uptime can I provide to my users? How much SLA can I provide? Can I design my storage across rows? Can I design my storage across racks? Can I keep my storage across rooms or data centers? That changes my SLA. Can I design my storage to be across power domains? Can it be across network domains? It changes my SLA to a very, very large extent. The final point, data protection methods. Can I use physical RAID protection? Can I go for replicas? Can I go for erasure coding? Is my application designed to understand erasure coding? If not, I have to use something else. So these are some of the key design principles. To go in depth, we need to understand the real character of the storage workloads. The character of your storage workloads depends upon few traits. IOPS, is my application or does my application require high IOPS? Do I have high transactional based workloads in my environment? How do I design my storage to accommodate these high IOPS? Second point, capacity. Can I start small? If I grow big to petabytes of capacity, is my storage or will, I, will, will my storage be able to accommodate these large capacities? Can I have a distributed scale out storage platform? Is my storage capable of doing it? The fourth, third point, throughput. Does my environment have large throughput or high sequential kind of workloads? Can I have a different types of backends to support it? Like SaaS based drives, can I have NVMe based cards to support high throughput kind of environment? Does it support tiering? Probably tiering makes sense for throughput kind of applications. Can I have tiering in my storage? Read write ratios. 
90% read, 10% write. Other way around, 10% read, 90% write. My storage architecture changes a lot. IO patterns, sequential, random, random read, random write, sequential read, sequential write. This changes my storage patterns a lot, storage architectures a lot. Protocols, what kind of protocols do I need? Based on that, I have to select my storage platform. Can my storage platform give me block, object, and file system? Probably that's what I need. IO size, is it 4K? Is it, is it in megabytes of size? Is it in terabytes of size? That changes my architecture a lot. <coughs> Latency, one of the critical factors. Does my applications need a low latency environment? Does my applications understand a sub-millisecond kind of environments? Do I need SSDs? Do I need 40 gig pipes? Do I need lossless protocols? These all matters. And we talked about the technical factors. How about discussing about business factors which affects your storage design? Do I have mission critical applications in my environment? If I have mission critical applications in my, in my environment, I would need a disaster recovery. Does my storage have native replication methodologies to protect your data? Can it integrate with my cloud platform? Can I have my backup integrated with my storage so that I can have, take a backup to an another storage platform? How can I reduce my cost? Can I have commodity-based architectures to reduce my cost? Can I have x86-based environments for my storage? That gives me a standardized architecture across compute and my storage. It helps me to reduce my administrative overhead. It helps me to reuse my hardware across multiple lines of businesses. Can I have hyperconvergence in my storage? Probably I have some workloads which are okay to be on a hyperconverged environment. Choose a storage which shows you a roadmap on hyperconvergence. How about the management tools? Can I do patching, upgrade, monitoring, utilization, adding disk, adding servers? All this should be done by a management utilities. How about having a management tool from a storage vendor itself without depending on a third party tool? How about having advanced features like compression, deduplication? Probably you have large capacities of data like backup, archive. It might be good to have dedupe and compression so that I can save on my cost. Things have gone wrong for many. Many have used or many have given importance to IOPS and forget about latency. IOPS can be increased by having more and more SSDs. But latency is your storage design architecture. It's an architecture by, from your storage vendor. Or it's something which you are architecting. Many have chosen desktop class disk over enterprise class disk. Desktop class disk are prone to failures. It cannot sustain vibrations. Your environment becomes messier. Many have chosen storage which was not future proof. Today I wanted to do containers. My storage is not integrated with containers. It does not understand Kubernetes. It cannot work with Kubernetes. I'm completely locked down. Many have used LBM as a backend. I couldn't implement HA. I couldn't implement live migration. So all, all these kind of different factors, non-technical, technical factors should be considered when you go for an efficient storage design. Next, we will discuss about what are the different attributes and characteristics a storage would need while integrating with OpenStack, OpenStack Cloud? Thanks, Rahul. <clears throat> uh, Rahul clearly explained uh, what of the general strategies that you need to follow while choosing a storage from a business point of view, from an IO pattern for from, from the IO pattern point of view for your workload, and he also explained the six key design principles that you need to follow while choosing a right storage to meet your business as well as your workload requirements. Now let's uh, get into OpenStack specific uh, things that you need to consider 
while choosing a right storage for OpenStack. So um, uh, before going to the, uh, before starting with the, the real factor that we need to consider, let's try to understand briefly what is OpenStack. So OpenStack is an operating system for the cloud, an open source operating system for cloud infrastructure as a service. So OpenStack is a collection of the services that does various functions. All these services are stitched together to form an operating system for the cloud. So the highlighted services here, Nova for compute, and uh, Cinder for block services, uh, Glance for image management, Swift for uh, object, uh, object storage, and Manila for file sh uh, file shared file system as a service. All these uh, five services are the primary consumers of the storage. Among these, Cinder, uh, Swift, and Manila, you know that these storages are consumed by the workloads that you are going to use directly. Nova ephemeral storage and uh, Glance are going to, going to use uh, storage to, to store the operating system data for your instances. So uh, with this in mind, let's get into, into the next slide. So um, the first thing that you need to consider, what kind of stor stor storage strategy that you need for OpenStack. So uh, do I need a software design storage? Is it the right fit for my OpenStack cloud? Or should I go with a SAN or NAS appliance storage backend that I have in my data center instead of going with a software design storage? Or should I go with a hybrid strategy where I'm going to connect both a software defined storage and a storage appliance into the OpenStack and I selectively distribute my workloads into either of the storage by following the requirements, depending upon the requirements. So what is best for me? So an answer for this clearly depends on what kind of workloads that you are going to run and how predictable the storage utilization of the workload is going to be from a capacity and performance point of view. And second, whether this is whether you are going to design a private cloud or a public cloud. If you are going to design, you use this storage for a private cloud, where you know what kind of workloads that you are going to use, and you know the characteristics of the workload, and how much storage capacity that you need, you need for those workloads, and you you know you know and you have sufficient storage uh, in your storage appliance, then it may be okay for you to just connect that storage to the existing, uh, that open stack to the existing storage. Uh, on the other hand, if you are going to run a public cloud where normally you are unable to predict these this capacity requirements and other requirements that I just explained, and or you, are, you just have a private cloud but you cannot do any kind of uh, prediction of the workloads that you, you are going to use, then it's uh, better to use a software design storage that is going to allow you to, 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 to scale massively so that it's going to allow you to resource the storage, uh, uh, pool the storage resources and to allow you to massively scale. Or you can also go for a hybrid strategy where you, uh, you connect uh, some applications which requires shorter I.O. path, or which are sensitive for latency, I.O. latency into the uh, uh, fiber channel storage, or, and the rest of the workloads you are going to connect into the sand storage. So please understand the concept. A software design storage is well aligned with translating the illusion of infinite capacity into reality than using a, a storage appliance which cannot scale <coughs> beyond the limit. So uh, let's get into the next important point, shared storage. Do you need, uh, uh, so there are three, four different components that I just explained for OpenStack. Should I connect all the components into the same storage? Or should I connect Nova into a local storage of each compute node and use a shared storage for Cinder? Then uh, use a Swift or a different object storage for Glass? Is that the right choice? Or should I connect all of them into the same, same storage? So uh, an ideal approach is to connect all of them into the same storage. And throughout the next slides, we are going to explain why this is a better idea. So uh, the next important, this is the most important point that you need to consider while choosing a storage for OpenStack. That is how well the storage is integrated with OpenStack. 
this is most important. It's very, very, very important to consider. So um, to understand uh, the integration point of view, so we need to first check whether the storage vendor is, is providing a driver to integrate the open stack, open stack with the storage. If there is no driver provided the vendor, then it may not be, there, there may not be any integration with open stack. So um, uh, to understand uh, the first integration point, you need to check whether there is an integration that uh, the driver provides to integrate Nova, Glance, and Cinder. So um, to understand uh, that concept uh, in detail, let me just uh, give you an example. So you have a requirement to, to create an application, the infrastructure for an application that requires that you provision 100 instances, maybe from same image or from a different, from 100 different images. So you are going to provision that, and this need to be distributed into 100 different compute nodes. So if there is no integration between Nova, Glance, and maybe Cinder, depending upon the requirements, that means each compute node is going to download the image into the compute, compute node local storage, or whatever storage Nova is going to use. So suppose you have a 10 GB or 20 GB image, and 100 parallel downloads are going to happen, how much time it is going to take to, to finish the provisioning of the application? So on the other hand, if there is a driver for, for the storage, and the driver provides an integration between Nova and Glance, then uh, under the hood, the storage is going to create copy on write images for 100 copy on write images within the storage layer that it's going to instantly start those instances. So this does not require any kind of download and it's, it's help you to save network bandwidth. It help you to save disk space. It also, most importantly, it's going to support a rapid provisioning that I just explained the normal uh, within the cloud characteristics. A rapid provisioning to achieve a rapid provisioning, this integration is, is very, very, very important. So uh, let's uh, get into the other point. This is not the only integration point. So you are going to create a volume from an image, maybe, or you are going to create an image from a volume. So there should be a tighter integration between Cinder and uh, uh, Glance at that time. Then you, you want to create snapshot for your Cinder volumes. So that means the snapshot functionality should be avail handled by the driver within the storage layer rather than depending on the open stack side. So, uh, so the driver will rapidly take a snapshot with the, using the storage functionalities and backup. Okay, backup is also very, if the driver provides an integration for backup, then the, then the storage will take the backup of the volume rather than depending, uh, wasting the resources within the compute node. So uh, with all this in mind, first thing, you, you check whether the, the vendor provides a driver, driver, if the driver has all these integration in it, and maybe more. And the next important thing, how well the driver is tested and certified. If it's tested and certified by the, between the, I mean, by the OpenStack vendor or by the storage vendor. That is also important. If, if it is tested and certified, your experience with that, using with that driver is going to be seamless. And, okay. So, okay, just uh, want to reiterate, how, how do you understand this? I mean, uh, just looking at, uh, how, do, how, how can you understand whether the, there is an integration between uh, the OpenStack and storage and, and uh, whether this meets all the points that I just explained? So, explicitly, ask the storage vendor to prove, or the OpenStack vendor to prove whether what level of integration you have with the driver. So um, you request a POC and ask the, vendor, ask the vendor to showcase how much time it takes to boot 100 instances. And what happens under the hood when I launch 100 instances simultaneously? And what happens when I take a, a snapshot? What happens when I take a backup? And most importantly, check with the vendor whether there is any uh, uh, the storage can be integrated with the deployment tools. At least the, st the, the deployment tool for OpenStack must support integration, integrating the OpenStack deployment with the storage out of the box. And as I explained, the benefits of using the integration is it helps you to save disk space, it helps you to save network bandwidth, it helps you to support to, to achieve rapid provisioning of the resources. So the next important point 
Is it future proof? So as I explained, OpenStack is a collection of services. And more and more new services are getting added day by day. And there may be a requirement to have a storage for those new services. So in future, you realize that the current storage that I have selected cannot support my future requirements, then you are going to end up investing in a different storage technology at that, at that time. So at you, even if the storage solution that you are going to choose does not have the integration uh, with the new new services, explicitly ask your storage vendor, are you planning to add support for um, maybe Hadoop integration with Sahara? Or do you support uh, containers? Or can I use OpenShift on, uh, uh, as a backend for OpenShift or any other PaaS services? So this is, this is very, very important. And other, another important one just that I will explain, uh, don't choose uh, the storage that is not known to work. So that means the LVM backend, and this is good for a POC and just showcase how OpenStack works, but it's never good for a production deployment because it's not going to give you the, the latency or, or any other uh, requirements that you need for your workloads. So uh, let me just summarize what I just explained. So you first look at uh, workload requirements and your business strategy, uh, your strategy to meet your business requirements. Then you are going to decide whether you need a hybrid strategy or a single storage strategy. Then you are going to, to check then what level of uh, integration is there between the storage vendor and the OpenStack? Is the driver testing certified? And how does the driver handle various functions within the, within the uh, OpenStack? And most important, when it comes to support, is there an agreement between the OpenStack vendor and a storage vendor for collaborative support? If it is tested and certified, it's very good. If it is not, then at least the, both the vendors should be a member of uh, TSNet so that there should be a collaborative support between both vendors when you hit, land into a problem, when you hit a problem. And how, whether the deployment tool is capable to deploy and integrate uh, OpenStack the storage. It's too much to expect for the OpenStack deployment tool to deploy your storage but it should support integrating OpenStack into your storage out of the box during the deployments itself. This helps you to, to manage the life cycle for your OpenStack without any problems. And finally, is the storage future proof or not? And with that, all this in mind, I will hand over to Rahul to briefly explain uh, Red Hat self-storage and how it's going to be one of the uh, right storage for OpenStack. All right. So Red Hat Self Storage is a distributed petabyte scalable for cloud and beyond. Self gives you multiple different protocols. Self, first of all, it's block. Self can give you block. Self can give you file systems. And Self can also provide you object storage. Even with that, we are now try, trying to provide more and more services with Self. We have introduced iSCSI gateways so that you can start supporting your Windows and Linux physical boxes or virtual machines. And moving forward, we anticipate that we will be able to support different hypervoices like VMware or Hyper-V. That's in the roadmap. But as of today, we support iSCSI with Windows and Linux boxes. We also have introduced NFS gateways. NFS gateways implemented on top of Rados gateways. So it's a translator which sits on top of uh, object storage which helps you to access, the legacy applications can access your object storage via NFS gateways. So in a nutshell, so Ceph is able to provide you multiple different protocols, multiple different types of services so that you can accommodate different types of applications into one single storage platform. And today, Ceph is not just about scale out capacity. Ceph can support different types of IO criteria. It could be high IOPS, it could be high throughput, or it could be a capacity intensive platform. So when we, when we think about high IOPS platform, we have certified all flash kind of arrays, like Samsung, SanDisk, they have certified Ceph on all flash arrays. It also means that we can support databases, like MySQL, PostDRE, MariaDB, all those databases are supported in Ceph. So low latency, high IOPS, definitely Ceph can run on that. High throughput, like media content, media, media sharing, content distribution, uh, photos, medias, large files, high throughput, fantastically works with Ceph. 
12 to 36 disk kind of environment is a best candidate for high throughput kind of applications with SAS kind of disk. The last one, high dense environments. Self supports 60 to 72 disk per server that gives you a large capacity on one single chassis. That means you are reducing your per GB cost. So uh, use cases like archive, backup, all those things are wonderfully fit for uh, high dense environments. So Ceph can support multiple different IO criteria and multiple different kinds of backends. So when it comes to protection, Ceph protects your data in two different ways. One is replicas, the second is erasure coding. So software defined storage technologies protects data without, without physical hard, physical RAID mechanisms. So first one, replicas, Ceph by default creates three copies. It has an advantage whenever, whenever a disaster happens, that means when something goes wrong, when, when, when a disk disc, disc goes out or when a server goes out, your recovery is much faster. Why? Because you don't have to recreate data from parity. It's just a matter of copying from the other copies. But it has an overhead. Because it creates three copies, it, you need three times the capacity. When you think about erasure coding, erasure coding is a software RAID mechanism. So when we compare that with a physical RAID, physical RAID is confined within a server. If you configure a RAID 6, you can, maybe you can go up to two disk of failure, two failure, two disk failures. But when it comes to a server failure, you are going to lose the whole data. But when it's a software RAID mechanism, erasure coding spans across servers. In this example, if you have six servers, and if you are configuring four plus two, that means your data chunks and the parity is across multiple servers. That means you can fail two disks as well as two servers. The overhead over here is that when a server fails, you have to recreate data from parity. That increases your CPU cycles and RAM capacities. But the advantage here is that it doesn't have capacity overhead. Capacity overhead is just 50 percentage. 4 plus 2 is 50 percentage. If it's 8 plus 3, it's 33 percentage, not 300 percentage like how replicas was. And com coming to features and functionalities, we had a look at OpenStack survey. So OpenStack survey says that 65 percentage of the OpenStack deployment uses Ceph as the default backend for block storage. And when it comes to manual deployments for file systems, 53 percentage of manual deployment uses Ceph as a backend, mainly because of a deeper, tighter integration with OpenStack. Ceph is heavily integrated with OpenStack across multiple different services which OpenStack provides, provides us. Ceph is highly scalable, petabyte scalable. We have customers using uh, Ceph for 55 petabytes, uh, 30 petabytes, 35 petabytes. So when we talk about Ceph, it's all about scale and multi-petabyte scale. Ceph supports encryption. Ceph can do automatic rebalancing. Say, for example, you have 10 nodes and one node goes down. Nobody has to intervene on that. Ceph automatically recreates the data onto the other existing nine nodes. Snapshots, clones, yes, replication. Ceph do have native replication for disaster recovery and that too integrated with OpenStack. Ceph uses Crush. Ceph does not have metadata servers. That actually helps us to do a large scale out mechanism. It's a quick calculation. Ceph does not use metadata mechanisms. We do support hyperconvergence. Today, we support NFE workloads for hyperconvergence. And moving forward, we are looking forward to have to accommodate general workloads for hyperconvergence. Ceph can support containers. Ceph can provide block storage to OpenShift platforms. Ceph can be deployed as a container as well. Moving forward, coming, uh, coming this June, Ceph will be able to be uh, provisioned as a container. From a support standpoint, from a subscription standpoint, one single subscription provides you all the different functionalities. Cloning, snapshots, replication, everything comes with one single subscription, not like other storage providers where you need to buy subscription or licensing for each and every functionality. Everything comes within the subscription. Online upgrades, we do support online upgrades and we do have a management console which is called Red Hat Storage Console where you can do all your utilization, management, monitoring, lifecycle, everything can be done from a management GUI. 
Uh, thinking from a disaster recovery standpoint, for an object storage, we do support multi-site configuration. That means you can have multiple different Ceph clusters sitting all over the world as one single global cluster, having one single namespace across all these clusters. And we do support active-active architectures. That means if you have two-site architecture, both sites can do read and write, and they protect each other having a bidirectional replication. When it comes to block storage protection, we do support replication using RBD mirroring. It's a one-to-one -one mirroring where you can fail over your cluster from one side to another when disaster happens. And that is integrated with single volume replication APIs. So it's completely integrated with OpenStack for an automated disaster recovery process. Backup strategies, yes, uh, Ceph is integrated with Cinder Backup. It's integrated with Cinder Backup in such a way that you can schedule policies, you can backup your data to an another Ceph cluster. So it's completely integrated with OpenStack today. And console-wise, we talked about that. Uh, Ceph has a management GUI. This has been introduced in Ceph 2.0 in dual version. So it can do utilization of your RAM, CPU, network. You can do trending up to a certain extent. You can do patching, upgrades. Even you can deploy your Ceph cluster from console. But if you want to have a very customized install, you can use Ansible-based installers. Uh, GUI can be used for a default configuration, but when it comes to customized configuration, use Ansible-based installers. Something interesting which is coming up as well, we are trying to replace file store. That means file store was a good candidate for hard disk. We are trying to replace that with blue store. Why? Because we are seeing more and more SSDs coming up these days, and we want to exploit the performance of SSDs. So in order to exploit the perform performance of SSDs, we are trying to bring in Blue Store, where we are trying to replace the XFS layer and trying to write data onto the disk directly. We anticipate the performance might go up to two to three times. That's, that means more and more high transactional based workloads can be accommodated by Ceph. So if you are interested in reading more about uh, Ceph configuration, reference guides, architecture configurations, hardware configurations, sizing guides, and things like that. It's publicly available. We have done a lot of work with different hardware players, and we have come up with all these different sizing guides and reference architectures. You can uh, download it and read it. It's publicly available. And with that, we, we would highly recommend to uh, you to go through all the six key design principles and different non-technical and technical aspects of uh, designing your storage. And do consider storage as a Linux operating system. Consider a storage which is a general purpose storage for OpenStack. So with that, we conclude our session. Any questions, we are open for questions.